see somebody's on cholesterol lowering medication, right? And then they get a side effect of that, and maybe that's so it lowers your cholesterol. Yeah. But now the ecosystem's out of balance. And maybe you start to get muscle pain, and then all of a sudden they give you another drug, some Tylenol for the muscle pain, and then you start to get headaches, and then they give you another drug, because what they're doing is they keep looking reductionistically looking at one piece, and ultimately. All your your health's like a scorecard. There's a book called The Body Keeps Score, but it's like your health's a scorecard, and it tells you how you're doing, right? Your blood work tells you how you're doing. The question is, do we see our bodies as part of nature, where we look at it holistically, or do we see our bodies as kind of reductionistic, or we look at just a symptom? And the example is, if you're tired, does that mean you need more caffeine, or we need to look at actually what makes a healthy body? Welcome back to another Rest, Eat, Move podcast. Uh, this is Chris today. I, I don't know, again, Matt, I don't know where Matt is, but he's <laughs> around here somewhere. But uh, we love him. We love our team. Uh, Rashawn's here. He's at the controls. Um, he is our, our leader in this space, and you're going to see more of him as time goes on. I even have uh, Tab Wayne Jackson over in the corner. Uh, Tab is one of our executive coaches uh, a lifelong friend, 74 years old, and he is a machine, and I love him like my brother. Um, but today we're going to talk about, uh, I, mean, I got a really special guest today, and his name is Dr. Jeff Crippen. And I've known Jeff for quite a while, and I know with both of his parents, he comes from a great family. And him and I are basically, I believe, um, we have the kind of the same passion mm. and very similar beliefs in this space. And so when he came out with his new book, which we're going to get into, um, and his new book is titled Timeless Youth. And it just came out, and I went through it. And my wife will tell you, when I was going through it, I was laughing um, <laughs> constantly because some of his analogies were just absolutely right on the mark. But I'm going to give you a little bit of formal introduction, then I'm going to let him talk. And we're going to have a great conversation, so I hope you really enjoy this episode. But uh, Dr. Crippen's me- mission is to live life to the fullest and help others do the same. He is a chiropractor, nutritionist, and coach who helps others unlock their true potential. His passion stems from his own personal struggles. At age six, he began suffering from migraines. For the next seven years, his headaches continued to worsen despite the best medical care he and his family could find. At his lowest point, Jeff had a debilitating headache that lasted without so much of a day of relief, and it lasted over two years. So again, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. At age 13, he found the powerful combination of chiropractic, and an individualized nutritional care. By combining these two powerful forces, he was able to unlock his own ability to heal. For the last decade, Jeff has helped clients both through chiropractic care and nutrition at his wellness clinic in St. Joe, Texas, as well as through individualized mindset coaching with the Advanced Coaching and Leadership Center. He finds a holistic approach, optimizing spirit, mind and body, the most efficient and effective way to create a lifetime of timeless youth. So welcome, my friend. I'm so excited to have you today. I know you're here from Texas with your girlfriend, Bailey. So again, we just gave you a little tour of a facility, but welcome, my friend. Awesome. It is, uh, it's wonderful to be here, Chris. Wonderful to reconnect again. And it's funny, as you were, you were talking about the book, I, I, we were talking a little bit before we get started. It reminded me of a conversation we had on the phone maybe five, six years ago. And it was a conversation centered around why don't people get it, right? When you talk about doing the right things and, and the frustration of it, it's just so simple, right? Not easy, but simple. And just why don't people get it? And I remember this conversation because you and I got into a, conver- a conversation about someone's worldview or the word I'm going to use is paradigm, but the, the viewpoint and the way they see the world. And basically what I look to do with the book and is make it clear there's a paradigm around medicine, and it's a lot of things. In the book, I compare it to the Titanic. I think the medical system in this country and around the world is like the Titanic. It is the biggest. It is the best. It has the nicest technology and the best bells and whistles. It's truly remarkable. The only problem is it's sinking. right? And we can go through some of the stats on what that is, but I'm sure that's familiar to your, your audience. But the, the, the system is sinking. And the question is why? How can you have such great technology and such great doctors and such great mind and intention people 
and we're still, as a country, getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And that's kind of, kind of the genesis of what I was thinking about uh, as we kind of worked on the book and, and worked to help patients. So let's go back in time a little bit about, let's give the, the listeners, the viewers, a little bit more like where you were. Again, we talked about that at age you know, 13 and on up. But where you are today, tell us a little bit about your business and what really inspired you to go down, go down this path. Yeah, so it's basically it was my own experience, right? So it, it honestly, it came out of frustration. <laughs> like if I'm fully honest, the only reason I'm here today doing what I'm doing is because I couldn't find somebody else um, or the people I tried to get help from didn't help me. So where that story started, I was about six years old um, and I had my first headache. Um, and you know, it's kind of the, one of those things you come home from first grade at that point, you kind of got a headache and then it starts to get worse and then it starts to get worse. And then you're going to see your pediatrician. Hey, my, my, you know, my parents would bring me right. And Hey, your son's got, uh, my son's got, you know, continuously migraines. So it's, uh, take some, ibupro- take some aspirin or children's Motrin or children's Tylenol. And then eventually became aspirin. And then it came ibuprofen and I'm seven, right? And eight, seven. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start looking at progressively worsening migraines in a kid that aren't responsive to traditional drugs, right? Analgesics. That's a red flag kind of symptom. You start looking for tumor or swelling of the brain or something growing, some kind of mass impinging on it. So that that led me, and you know, I'm eight at this point, so you know, you don't really know what's going on other than, hey, we're going to go see another doctor. But I just remember the frustration of you know, nothing helping. You try the drug and, you know, and you take an ibuprofen, it says take every four to six hours. Well, if the headache doesn't go away, you're taking it all day, <laughs> right? And if it doesn't go away for a week, you're taking it every four to six hours for a week. And then so you're constantly on it. Constantly on it. So it led us to, um, so eventually they decide, hey, this is getting pretty serious. I got a CT scan. You know, so you lay down and, you know, you get the, get the imaging and it came back with a spot on it and they didn't know what it was. So then they take you and get an MRI because we've got to figure, hey, we got a spot on your brain. We don't know what it is. This could be a problem. Um, and uh, I remember sitting in the neurologist's office, and the um, name was Dr. Wolf, uh, which is fitting considering some of the analogies we mm-hmm, give in the book. Sure. Um, but um, his name was Dr. Wolf, and he starts talking about uh, this mass they found in my brain. And it, it's called a it's type, it's type of tumor. Or it's not really a type of mass. It's a congenital cyst, so it's benign. Uh, they weren't sure if it was growing or not. Um, it's actually, for any sports fans out there, um, Urban Meyer, um, he had this particular type of cyst. He had really bad headaches connected to it. So anyway, it's a congenital, uh, congenital cyst in the brain. Um, and, but he says, you know, we, f- we found it, but we don't know if this is what's causing it, and we could do surgery or we cannot do surgery. And at eight years old, you know, you're kind of thinking, I kind of thought surgery might be cool. <laughs> I mean, as crazy as that sounds, it's like brain surgery. Because after I had suffered at this three, four years of headaches, almost, uh, you know, an incredible amount of time. And if somebody would have told me, hey, surgery might help your head. Sure, you kind of do it. Right. Because I, the, but the problem was, that was my paradigm, right? And that's what I'm getting to. My paradigm was, I have a symptom, you go to a doctor. And then you go to a doctor, and then you take a drug. And if the drug doesn't work, then you do surgery. And that was the kind of paradigm I was operating from. I, I wasn't even aware that anything else existed. So that led me to that doctor's office that he said, but I don't think we should do surgery. So I never did. And I remember feeling disappointed. Like, what do you mean? You know, I just kind of got hopeful that sure. maybe that surgery was going to be right. the answer. So, and then it ended up not being the answer. Um, so then you try different drugs and you go through that. So, and at its worst, as you said, it lasted for a couple of years or nonstop every moment, every day having a headache. So you get through all of that and, and I could, you know, it's basically, it was, you know, you know, tough you know, living in, you know, that kind of sure, pain for, absolutely. for a couple of years. And so you just start trying stuff. And you have people come up to you like, hey, I heard red wine's good for headaches. It's like, I'm 12. Then they heard some people say red wine might be causing your headaches. I was like, I'm still 12. You know, it's not the issue. And then maybe coffee's good for a headache. Maybe coffee causes headaches, right? You go through all this stuff and it's just, there's so much confusion out there in the area of nutrition. Like people just don't, don't know most of the time. And yeah, some of that's probably deliberate. <laughs> um, but I went through, and it just got increasingly frustrating. Go to you know other doctors, and you just try different drugs, try different things. So eventually, I was trying. I was really so I got to college, and I was just trying to figure. I was trying. I took a f- medical physiology class, which is basically anatomy is the structure of the body, physiology is the function of the body, and I took it just for fun, just because I was trying to learn about myself to try to help myself mm-hmm. get better. So it was only because I was in that medical system for seven, eight, nine, ten years, and it wasn't working for me 
that I was just trying to I was just trying to go out and play basketball with my friends. Yeah, I just mean, the honestly. frustration of just trying to live life. Yeah, and eventually you figure out if you can't find someone to solve it, you might want to try to solve it yourself. So that's kind of how I got into this. And eventually, mm-hmm. um, you know, graduated college um, as a Spanish major uh, in pre-med, did Spanish in pre-med, went to chiropractic school, um, got super interested in nutrition, and found a doctor who was doing a lot of holistic nutrition, food-based medicine, mm-hmm. right, specifically targeted and... Um, it was really powerful combination. So changed my major, went to chiropractic school, and then I decided I want to do what was helpful for me and I want to help others that way. And that kind of took me to open my own office in 2011. And I've been doing that for a little over 10 years now. Yeah. And, and I, it was interesting when you were talking about your book and at the very end, you were saying that if, if you would go back in time and you said, say, I'm going to write a book, you'd yeah. go, I may be the last person that would be writing a book. So I'll tell you a funny story around that. So I went to college. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This The idea, English was my least favorite right, subject. That's what I, I had to laugh. I'm like, Throughout. English is your your worst <laughs> subject, and yeah. now you're writing a book. So I, just one quick story. So I, I was getting frustrated. Uh, I was actually ready to drop out of college. I was getting kind of frustrated with the kind of the education system or just college at the time. So I was thinking about dropping out. Then my parents were like, well, you should stay in. So I said, I'll stay in until I figure out what I want to do next. And um, I looked at 13 different majors including create your own major and have no major. The only major I was sure I wasn't going to look at was English. And yeah, I, I looked at a bunch. Said, I'm going to be undecided. I'm going <laughs> to create my own major, but it sure is not going to be English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And turns out, so the ultimate irony yeah. of the universe, you yeah. know, is um, I love it. here I am with a book. So <laughs> right. it's, it's funny. So when I was reading your book, so again, I really would like to kind of, we can go through yeah. uh, kind of some of these areas. And I think, I think you know, the listeners will really enjoy kind of how you broke this down. And it basically... Um, different sections. So I want to begin with, you start out, your chapter one is called the Titanic problem. Yeah. And, you know, I think everybody is familiar with the whole disaster of the Titanic, but walk us through a little bit about that. And then I got some other points on here, but I just really liked how you opened up the the book with the Titanic. It really got my attention right away. Yeah, so as I said, I think the Titanic is the biggest. It was the biggest and the best. It was the most technologically advanced, and they had wireless transmitters that could transmit so so far, and they're farthest of any ship available, and they had the watertight compartments that they kind of showed in that movie Titanic. But it was basically this technology that made this ship unsinkable. So it was unsinkable for the day before it left port, and five days later, it's at the bottom of the Atlantic. So the question is, what happened? Right? How did the best technology and the best people and the best intentions fail so spectacularly? And unfortunately, that's what I think was going on with the medical system today, and that's been my experience with it, and I don't think it's changing and probably continuing or getting worse. And you know, one study I, I put in there is, is, a, is a study called Death by Medicine. It's a, Dr. Gary Null did the study. And basically, mm-hmm. in this country, you know, heart disease or cancer kills about 600,000 people in the United States. And it's, it's very similar worldwide, but I got the numbers on hand for the U.S. and, and, and you know, heart, so cancer is about 600,000, heart disease 700, 750,000 a year. Um, and Dr. Null said medicine is killing up to a million people a year. So between correctly prescribed medications, incorrectly prescribed medications, you know, what's called nosocomial infections, which are basically hospital infections, you add up all of the side effects of our traditional medicine system, and it's killing close to a million people a year. And in fact, is something else is, you know, occasionally doctors go on strike. It's very rare, but they can do, go on strike. And they've said they actually studied what happens to the death rates in different countries as doctors go on strike. And when doctors go on strike from elective, they, they still practice emergency medicine, but they go on strike from all elective procedures, death rates go down. And this has been shown in California. This has been shown in Israel. This has been shown across countries that death rates go down when doctors go on strike. So you have to wonder what's really happening there. When I, and I really like what you started out with the, with the Titanic, it, is why did it sink? Yeah. And and really, you narrowed it down to one thing, and that one thing is that it was not going to sink. Yeah, they thought it was unsinkable. It was unsinkable. Right? Because so you had all the you know the the, the icebergs had moved here. Yeah. The, the 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 you know the way the sky was, and then you used the analogy of well. I don't know how many vessels did the same exact path, but none of them sunk. Yeah, I think in the in the previous X amount of time, there had never been a worse a disaster in like the twenty years. So how, the yeah, exactly what you're saying. How many other boats crossed the Atlantic same at that thing, same time? Same everything, and were fine. So what was different about the Titanic? And what was different is they went in with the viewpoint that says this is unsinkable. So 
Captain going too S- fast. Exactly. So Captain Smith didn't slow down. Didn't slow down. He sped up, and they were right. trying to set records. And they didn't. They said we're not going to sink. So you doesn't know, matter. We don't need the we don't need the right. lifeboats, right? So it was just it was that whole viewpoint was warped, right? And that influenced the actions, and then we got a disastrous result. And I think what you what you what led into this is now let's talk a little bit about the definition of health. Yeah. So what is your definition of health? So what, what's really interesting is health comes from the root word meaning whole. So the root word of health is. It's kaleo, but it basically means whole. So health comes from the root word of wholeness. So I define health in the book as a state of optimal, you know, a state of optimal function, spirit, mind, body, right? And and then you think, and I get kind of give the example of the book, is like, when's the last time you walked into your doctor's office and say, hey, I'm looking to have optimal function of spirit, mind, and body. How can I help you? You know, the problem is they probably put me on a drug, like some kind of mental drug, which you know, for something like that. But the system's not set up. The point is the system's not set up. The system is not, the medical system in this country is not set up around optimal function of spirit, mind, and body. It's set around treating disease. And I think the point of this podcast today is we're not trying to beat up the whole no. medical world. We're trying to create more awareness yeah. that it, it, it's the Titanic. It's going to sink. It's yeah. already sinking, but we all have to get in the game of that. And I like what you said earlier that the traditional healthcare model today is there's three steps. Yeah. So walk us through the real, and they're so simple, but it's so true. Every time I, I, like you said, if I walked in and said, I want optimal health, what does that mean? Or yeah. I want to feel amazing or whatever it might be. The system's not set up for that. But what the system's set up for is a three-step process. The first one is you have a symptom. You walk in there, I've got knee pain, I got headache, I have blood pressure. Great. Your doctor knows exactly what to do. The second one is diagnose the problem. And the third one is give you a drug or a treatment for it. Right, the whole medical system it's it's you know very efficient at right. treating disease. Right, but and it I, ain't creating health. Right, and I liked, I think, um, and you might have used this. We'll, we'll get into this more, but I was using this the other day after reading your book. But we were talking about this earlier <laughs> about leafitis. Yeah, and I'm like, people get that if the leaf is turning brown, what what would you do? So walk, walk talk us through that one yeah. real quick. So the the example I give is. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's a real basic example. If you've got a plant in your house, what do we know? Plants need three things. They need water, they need air, and they need nutrients, good soil. Right. Air, water, good soil. So you have a plant that's got a brown leaf. What, what do you do? Well, you know, does it have the air, the oxygen, you know, the sunshine? Does it have the sunshine? Does it have the water? Um, does it have the good soil? And you just look, does it have those three things? Right? And so you don't, and the, and what we don't do with, we don't treat plants like we treat humans. We don't look at the tiny plant that has a brown leaf and say, oh, wow, and then give it some fancy name in Latin or Greek, like, oh, this plant has brown leafitis. Right. Right. And what do we do for brown leafitis? Well, maybe we spray paint it green, or maybe we do a leafectomy and cut it off. Yeah, I like, I like the sc- spray paint it green. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and That's going to fix it. Yeah, exactly. And I think you've talked about yeah. the, kind of the oil light in the car, right? right. Just kind of spray it over, cover up the symptom, <laughs> right. or actually say, hey, this, the brown leaf's a sign something's happening, and what can we do? to give that plant what it needs. Yeah, when the engine light goes on and we just hope it goes off, <laughs> right? Exactly. If I close my eyes. So again, the beginning is the Titanic problem that the Titanic was unsinkable. We're kind of looking at our healthcare today. It's it is big and shiny. We're really good at treating, you know, you get in a trauma, yeah. we're the best. Emergency medicine. So emergency absolutely. medicine, we are the best. We're not trying to throw anybody under the bus of that. Chapter 2, you talk about the Yellowstone principle. I thought this was fantastic. So walk us through the the, so the Yellowstone principle. Yeah, so to open the chapter, um, I tell the story of Yellowstone. And basically, Yellowstone had, for decades, had a problem with elk. They had way too many elk. And the elk were overpopulated, and when elk overpopulate, it knocks the bark off the tree. And then when enough bark gets off of the tree, the trees die. And then once the trees die, um, the birds don't have a place to live. And then without the wood from the trees, the beavers can't dam the rivers, which leads to erosion of the stream. So all these problems were happening in Yellowstone. So you know, the National Park Service is like, we need to fix this problem. Okay, so they think they have too many elk. So you know what they start doing? They just start going around and shooting the elk. Shoot the elk. Shoot the elk. And guess what? It didn't fix the problem. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. And if you like elk meat, then you got something going for you there. But it did not fix the problem. But the, so Because the question they didn't ask, they identified the problem. The symptom was too many elk. What they never got to was actually what was causing it. And turns out the, the source. The source of the problem. Yeah. The, the source of the problem was not a lack of hunters, right? That's not what caused the problem. What caused the problem was actually they removed the wolves um, from Yellowstone in the 1930s, 
uh, they killed off all the wolves. So what they what they finally did after shooting the elk and trying to do all these things, they reintroduced 13 elves in the 90s to Yellowstone. 13 elves in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone covers three states. It's 2.2 million square miles. So three. So they just brought some wolves back slowly. Yep. Introduced them in there. Introduced the wolves back to the ecosystem. And then what happened is some of the wolves ate the elk, but also just the presence of the wolves moved the elk from the plains into the more wooded areas where they can protect themselves better. And because of that, the trees weren't, the bark wasn't being scraped off the trees. The trees came back. The songbirds came back. The beavers now have things to grow their dam. They can now, you know, there's less erosion of the river, and the ecosystem went into balance. So 2.2 million square miles 2.2 million. was fixed because they added 13 elves and 14 the next year. So, so yeah. when you look at the wolves themselves, I really like that it's not just that the wolves would eat the, the elk. It would, get, it would move the wolves. Exactly. And so the whole ecosystem was now back into balance by bringing the wolves back into play. Exactly, because they weren't, yeah, exactly. That's the difference between them and hunters. Right, hunters were just shoot, shooting their elk or killing a couple elk, but this actually changed the ecosystem that, you know, amazing that it came into balance and it grew up a certain way and everything was in balance until humans took the wolves out, threw it out of balance, and then the only way to put so it again, back. The whole analogy is, is we got to get the ecosystem back into balance, which leads us into looking at the body, you know, separate from nature. So walk us through like, okay, so I started that, analogy but now how does that relate to because again you're talking about the whole ecosystem versus the parts yeah yeah so the question is do we see our bodies as part of nature where we look at it holistically or do we see our bodies as kind of reductionistic or we look at just a symptom and the example is if you're tired does that mean you need more caffeine or we need to look at actually what makes a healthy body like when I had a symptom of headaches, the doctor saw, here's a symptom, let's, let's shoot the pain. Let's give you a drug for it to handle it. But that actually didn't answer the question of why I had the pain in the first place. So if they would have looked at me like a plant and said, well, what does the body need? Well, I need to optimize my diet. I need to optimize my movement. I need to optimize my rest. Yeah. And I like the word optimize. Yeah. Let's work at the foundation. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, you know, I'm thinking rest, eat, move from your last book. I mean, that's the foundation of it. But it's like, it's not perfect. It's not be perfect. It's optimized. It's moved slowly better towards that way. And ultimately, all your, your health is like a scorecard. There's a book called The Body Keeps Score, but it's like your health is a scorecard, and it tells you how you're doing, right? Your blood work tells you how you're doing. So you, you kind of hit on this real quickly, um, but let's just go back here just yeah. for a second and talk about the reductionistic thinking. Yeah. So let's, let's make sure everybody understands that. Yeah, and... You know, I think we see this a lot, and you, you know, you see it a lot with medications, right? Somebody has, and I give the example of books, somebody's on cholesterol lowering medication, right? And then they get a side effect of that, and maybe that's. So it lowers their cholesterol, yep. but now the ecosystem's out of balance. And maybe you start to get muscle pain, and then all of a sudden they give you another drug, some Tylenol for the muscle pain, and then you start to get headaches, and then they give you another drug because what they're doing is they keep looking reductionistically, looking at one piece, mm -hmm. looking at one symptom and giving you something for that. Or you have a doctor for your heart and you have a doctor for you know your kidneys and you have a doctor for your liver right all these the more the more specialized someone is as a doctor the less they look at in the body right the medical system rewards specialization which is great it's incredible knowledge but you need someone looking at the whole okay, you need to, somebody looking at the whole uh, the tree and exactly. back to the wolves i mean let's get rid of the wolves let's get rid of the elk you know whatever it might be we're going to fix the problem, and reality is it, it needs to all work together in nature. Exactly, because if you brought in, you know, why are the trees dying? They could have brought in the best tree specialist in the world. But if he was all he was doing was studying the tree, that wouldn't have told him there's no wolves in the Yellowstone, right? If you look only at why the tree's dying, you'll get one answer. But if you step back and see the whole thing, then you can see all those dynamics and how they, how they interplay with yeah, each other. Yeah, where the songbirds go? Maybe the songbirds <laughs> didn't like living there anymore. Yeah, yeah exactly. That wasn't the case. No, right? exactly, exactly. Yeah, all right, so that, so that kind of gives us an idea. So the Yellowstone principle is really back to looking at the whole ecosystem. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. So that's kind of the takeaway there. Yep. On Chapter 3, I, again, we're from you know, Lansing, yep. Detroit, we're a car manufacturing yeah. capital of the world at one point in time, still a big part of that. But chapter three is called the Model A Principle. Walk us through that one. Yeah, so this was um, the story of the story of Ford, right? The story of Henry Ford and the Model T, which was um, the, 
you know, the most co commercially successful car ever. So millions and millions and millions. And at one point, I mean, there was there had rubber plantations over in Brazil. I mean, they had all of these incredible pieces. It was incredible behemoth to build millions of cars back in the you know early. Because I remember you saying at the beginning of the book, I didn't real, I never knew this, but how many cars could actually be be produced in a year was a very small yeah. number until he decided to build this assembly line that I think he what you said in the book was like 15 million cars yeah. over a 20 year. And that's a lot of cars way yeah. back in the early 1900s. Back when, you know, people were producing 200 cars a year. 200. Right, you know, you're building them by hand. So it was an incredible thing he did. And what he did is he systemized the whole thing mm -hmm. and he made an assembly line. So what you do is you make it one size fits all. So, you know, the Model T was available in any color you wanted as long as that color was black. <laughs> right, for, mo for most of the time. And you yeah. know, can I have the blue one? Yeah. Uh-uh, nope, and just you know black. What? And you know why he picked black? Because the paint dried quicker than all the other colors. Mm. So everything was optimized for that. So it was very quick to build a whole bunch of cars if you build them all exactly exactly the same. And um, and I think that's what medicine, that's what the medical system does a lot. It sees us, as, it sees patients as Model Ts. Because when somebody comes in, you've got a unique story, Chris, and so do I. And if you, I'll tell you, if you had a headache and I had a headache, it's probably different reasons. And if we had a woman around her cycle that's having a headache, that's probably something different. If we have a College, a college kid who comes in hungover after the night before, he's got a headache for a totally different reason. If you've got a football player who just got a concussion, they got a headache for a different reason. So we can't assume that one symptom has the same cause, but often in medicine, all of those headaches would be treated the same way with, you know, with aspirin or Tylenol or pain reliever. But to actually create health, you have to actually understand the cause, and that's different one person to person. So what, what eventually Henry Ford, what would end up being the downfall of the Mod Model T is that he didn't ask the customers what they want, and he didn't allow for the individual variation. And an upstart competitor at the time was General Motors, was read, uh, run by a gentleman named Sloan. And what he said was, uh, he said, a car for every purse and purpose. So different price points, different reasons. I thought that was a great tagline. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And what he did was he's bringing individualization, customization. What do you want? And he was willing to ask that question. Henry Ford never did. Eventually, the Model T fell apart. Ford followed it up with the Model A, which is where I get the Model A principle, and that one was very much like GM's cars at the time, which different Model A models, based on what you might want, with more options and colors and customization. But for a long time, Henry Ford wasn't, he was resistant to change. Yeah, exactly, and that led to the downfall. And that's the big, big yeah, deal. Yeah, so, exactly. So, like you, I, 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 what you said here, uh, medical care has never been more expensive than it is today, but is it better? Yeah, statistically, I would say no. I mean, the amount, you know, th this is a stat from a few years ago, uh, but the U.S. would spend, on average, per person, over $7,000 per person on medical care each year. And yet the United States, and the last rankings the World or Health Organization came out with, was, was 39th. Um, Did everybody hear that? In the rankings. 39. 39th. And they were actually third... <laughs> Uh, among countries that started with the word united <laughs> both the united kingdom and the united arab emirates <laughs> were above them i mean costa rica was directly above the united states so we think of we have all this technology and we have all these great people and incredible you know some of the u.s medical colleges are some of the most revered in the world but we do have to look in the mirror and say with all of that and with all the money we're spending we spend more than twice as much as any other country in the world on medical care well, and I think I think you you know you and I both agree to this, but there's not a lot of looking at like if you looked at how we're trained and how we're educated, yeah. it's not on the radar screen. It's and it's just like the Model T. We're not willing to change that. It needs yeah. to change. My yeah. son asked me a long time ago, "What would you change, Dad?" I would change the educational system. <laughs> so, and I think the other thing too I want to touch on here is behavior and epigenetics. Mm. So why don't you just educate everybody a little bit more about why it's not your, you know, it's not your genes or it's not your, I'm, you know, pass this down from generation to generation, but how your behavior matters. Yeah. So, so the idea of the kind of the genetic revolution was happening in the nineties and the idea that they were looking for a gene for everything. Even I remember at one point they're looking for the happiness gene. If we can find the happiness gene, then we can make you happy. <laughs> right. And they were doing, um, called the Human Genome Project. So they were looking to sequence the entire genome. So they started with an earthworm and a fruit fly. And they say, well, the earthworm has like 15,000 genes and the fruit fly has like 20,000 genes. So the, the human being should have like over 100,000 genes because we ought to be much more complicated than a, 
earthworm or a fruit fly. <laughs> and, and what they found, because they knew, already knew there were 70,000 proteins in the body. So you figure 70,000 proteins, there's a few others that say like start here, stop here, you know, and, some, and control some edits. So they were thinking 70 to 100,000 genes is what they expect in the body. They found like t between 25 and 30,000. So it was this, they, and they couldn't figure out how do we get 70,000 proteins from less than 30,000 genes? And they couldn't make sense of it because the biology says one gene produces one protein, right? And that was the mistake. That was called like the, it's called the, actually called the central dogma of biology, which you don't usually think of dogma in biology. We think sure. of dogma in religion. But it's interesting, it's called the central dogma of biology that one, uh, one gene creates one protein. But what they found was that wasn't true. So then they had to go all the way back to the drawing board and figure out why were we wrong. And the answer to how they were wrong is what you brought up, which is epigenetics. So epi means above or upon, so above genetics. And what they found is there's things that control the genes. So the genes aren't the master control of the body. The genes are more like the effects. So what actually controls the genes? And that's where we start getting into food choices. That's where we start getting into lifestyle. That's what we start getting into what you eat um, that actually controls your genes. So people say, oh, you know, I, I love the story. Oh, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis because my family does. Okay, who in your family? Well, my great aunt Sally. Okay, but just her? You know what I mean? It's like just because great aunt Sally had rheumatoid arthritis, now you're destined to get it? I don't think that's true. And or my family has a high level of cholesterol or my exactly I, you know my family has high blood pressure or whatever and the statistically genetic genes count for about three to five percent of all disease you look at heart disease you look at cancer you look at things others there are true genetic diseases like down syndrome would be one that's a true genetic disease that's but most most diseases it's three to five percent of all diseases genetic so so the question is if, if diseases do run in families which totally happens that absolutely Correct. true you have tons for sure. of people what else runs in families other than genes the way you handle stress, the way you eat, you know, what kinds of food you eat, do you exercise, do you not? All of all of those things also get passed down from family member to family members and can be much more powerful than the genes. Well, I like how you said it's above the genes. Exactly. It's easy to it's easy to think for people to comprehend that it's above so if it's above, that means I have control my behavior exactly. is is also so for example, you know, like in my wife's family, cancer is very prevalent. Yeah. You know, her mother died at you know, 60. All of her uh, aunts died before 60. So obviously it's a big yeah. red flag. But again, w again, everybody has that genetic yeah. footprint. But what can we do? And I think that's the point when you're talking about this here is that there is opportunities to, to change. Yeah. And, and whether it's the Model T or you look at your lifestyle, that you're not doomed. You know, if I do yeah. want to... A car, I don't always have to have it in black, and yeah, exactly. it doesn't have, you know, a cruise control or whatever yeah, it might yeah, yeah. be. There's no iPhone chargers right. in the original Model T, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so I thought that was really interesting because, again, it is the master control of the body. But I think I loved how you kind of weaved it into this whole that you know we we can't be resistance to change. One size doesn't fit all. Yeah. We have to like if I if they have three people have headaches, you got to dig, dig deeper yeah. into it and say, okay, what's causing that? And the, the list goes on. Yeah. So. Absolutely. One, one thing to add on that, genes is, I did, the simplest analogy for genes is just think of books in a library. That's your genetic code. Epigenetics says you get to decide which books you read. All right. So the books are on the That's shelf. That's a great way to put it. Doesn't mean you have to read it. So your mom, or your wife may have some books on the shelf that have cancer Correct. in them. But she gets to choose through her lifestyle, you know, which one she chooses to read. Well, and, and I think everybody has their books on the shelf. Yeah, Absolutely. So I'm going to write that one down. Yeah. I'm going to steal that one from you. Yeah, great. But it's what you read. It's, it's, are you, do you choose what you read? Yeah. And that's, and that's what we do, you know. That's what you do through what you eat. That's what you do through, you know, the wheatgrass we're having here. That's what you do through yeah. your... Yeah, I'm torturing him, but he, he likes it like I do, so... Yeah. All right, so <laughs> chapter four. Now we're getting a little deeper here. I thought this was a little deep, but yeah. it also is amazingly powerful if you get the whole big picture, and that's called the quantum principle. So talk about the quantum principle. Yeah, so this one... Um, the power of no thing. Yeah, no. basically it's the power of nothing. So if you look at... Um, I, I begin telling the story of a fifth grade... Um, a fifth grade class, a fifth grade science class, and my teacher, uh, Mrs. Stanza, gave us homework, and we each had to make a model of an atom. So you can make a you know helium or hydrogen or calcium. You make a model, 
and then you put the little electrons around it. And if you remember that, you got a nucleus to an atom, and then you got the little electrons around it. I had to make a model. So I made a model. What I found out is the whole model was wrong. <laughs> so I made a little, I made an, I made, a, I put a, I, I, I hot glue gunned a bunch of coins to an orange mini basketball and then bent some wires around it to kind of be the electrons and put some pennies on that, right? And that was my model my atom. I made it out of coins and it was, you know, this big. The only problem is that's not the right model of an atom. And we've kind of known this for a while. Um, if, if the nucleus of an atom was the size of a kernel of corn, the closest electron would be two football fields away. So we think we're built out of something, right? We, we're built out of atoms, we're built out of molecules, we're built out of things. The truth is that atom is 99.9997% empty. Only it's not empty, it's full of energy. So we're actually made of energy, right? We were talking a little bit before about Einstein did one famous equation, E equals mc squared, which basically says, it basically simply says energy is mass and mass is energy. But the, the, the idea that the basic building block of the universe isn't something we can touch. I mean, I'm sitting on this chair. I'm touching that table, but it's made of energy. So everything is made of energy. And so what I what I wish knowing this now is I would have taken nothing to Mrs. Stanzik and turned that in and said, this is an atom. And I had nothing but an empty box. <laughs> you could have been outside playing and not having to worry about doing much exactly. homework. Exactly. <laughs> and if I did that, my actually model of the atom would have been much more correct than all the people who spent the time hot gluing coins <laughs> to a mini basketball. So kind of what you're, again, just so hang on, everybody. <laughs> this is a little deep. Yeah. But what Einstein says that mass is energy and energy is mass. Yeah. So that's, I mean, this is this is a big deal. So so let's, I want to take this a little deeper here. Yeah. Because, and I, I loved what you said here, but what we in, ignore in medicine is energy. Yeah. So the more I've been doing this, the more I realize we need to spend a lot more time teaching energy, talking about it, educating. So it's not like some craziness, yeah. quantum you know, principle that people are like, oh, this is too spooky for me. Yeah. But kind of walk us through that, that we ignore in medicine is the energy. Yeah. And, and, and we're, you know, we're skirting around a little bit of the woo-woo zone out here, but it's incredibly powerful. And one example I give in the book is, you know, you know, if I, we ask most people what cause heart disease, um, they say cholesterol, right? And they say, you know, I take, so I take my statin. Um, most people who listen to your podcast have, you know, learned otherwise for good, you know, for, and rightly so. But the idea is there's a certain thing that you're looking at as the cause of heart disease. So one example I give in a book is they actually did certain studies of people, you know, I'm sure most people can relate to this idea of you know someone who like the couple was married 50 years, the husband passed away at 80 or 85, and the wife's health went downhill right after, or the wife died shortly after, or the wife passed away first, and the husband, you know, and there's just like such like a, a week later or something. Exactly. Yeah. You see mm -hmm. it in, you see it like almost an uncanny amount of time. So what they found is after the death of a spouse, the partners, the surviving partner's risk of a heart dis uh, a heart attack went up 17-fold, like in the 24 hours after. And even six months later, it's an elevated risk. Re repeat that again. So after the death of a, sp a partner or spouse, the next the, the, the surviving spouse's risk of a heart attack goes up 17. 17. So 1,700% over the next couple, well, over the next couple few hours today. I mean, literally, you, so the, what they're showing is you actually can die of a broken heart. But where's the medical test for that? When's the last time you went to a doctor and, you know, you probably know people who went there and were prescribed statin drugs. But when they asked, the last time they asked, how are your relationships? You know, any, any recent deaths in the family? How are your relationships with your parents or your friends or your kids, right? We don't, we, the medical system ignores that. So what, what these principles are, if we look at, the Yellowstone principle, which is holism. We look at the Model A principle, which is the power of the individual. We look at this quantum principle, which is the power of nothing. These are the principles that are the lifeboat. So we gave the example at the beginning of the Titanic. The Titanic's the biggest, the best, like the medical system, but it's sinking. So, but rather than talk about the Titanic sinking, I want to write a book, and that's what this book is about. It's about the lifeboat. It's what's going to carry us the rest of the way towards health. Because that Titanic's not on a journey towards health. It's not going to make it to New York. Spoiler alert. 
right? So what is the lifeboat that's going to get us there? And the lifeboat is based on these five principles. So and that's I, the quantum principle. And I really like what you said. Okay, so back to the heart attacks. Yeah. It, we're going beyond things. Yeah. And I like that where you said no things yeah. or nothing. Yeah. So one potential cause of a heart attack, and everybody gets this, is stress. Yeah. But stress is not a tangible thing. Exactly. Let me touch it, feel it. Yeah. Where is it? I, I, you know. Yeah. So again, back to the energy. It's hard, really hard to debate that. You know, we, I think you would agree. I would agree. Probably eighty percent of healthcare challenges are stress related. Yeah. It, and that's energy. Exactly. It's not mass. It's energy. That's the point. You know, and, and there's an you know not to go too down too far down the quote from Einstein, but he at one point he said, the field is the sole governing agent of the particle. So what he said is if you want to control a particle, a piece of mass, you manipulate the energetic field it's in. Mm. And that's what stress is, Yeah. right? Stress is the energetic field we all live in, right? And that field can be positive, uplifting, supportive of healing, or it can be more prone to disease. But the point is that a true holistic healing system would recognize that and recognize the power of nothing or no thing, mm -hmm. or the power of energy. And I think the other analogy you used is when you look at mental health, for example, um, according to a popular thinking, is depression is caused by a chemical imbalance. Yeah. So uh, walk us through that a little bit, because you hear a lot with our today, you know, there's a lot of mental health, um, anxiety, depression, the list goes on and on, but one of the major um, co uh, contributors to depression is, is, is less. We, we, we can't touch it. Yeah. You can't. So walk, talk about that. I really liked what you were talking about that. Yeah. So mental. Uh, so since then, they've actually. I think it was mid last year. They actually came out with a huge retraction of those original studies that it was based on. So they actually, there's some fraudulent research done to prove what's called the serotonin hypothesis, which is basically a deficiency of serotonin is why they give depressant drugs. So that was actually proven as a medical fraud, <laughs> just what it's even based on. But the idea was they would give you a drug to manipulate what's called the serotonin receptors in your brain to try to change your mood. Anyway, it worked. Those drugs work 30 to 50% of the time. You know what else works 30 to 50% of the time? <laughs> Exercise, <laughs> right? Motion <laughs> creates positive it, emotion, right? You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Emotion is energy in motion, right? You're 100% right. So, Back to the energy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so exercise is as effective as two different, um, two different antidepressants. And then we can look at, you know, Sugar's effect on mood. There's a great book called Sugar Blues, mm -hmm. which basically talked yeah. about you, de you deplete a lot of B vitamins and minerals that are important for the brain health. But you, you, you step back from all of that. And at the beginning, those drugs were only designed to be taken for a year while someone got counseling to deal with the loss that comes up because, you know, depression is a real thing. It's a real thing. And, you know, it hits mm -hmm. us. And there's, there's been moments, I tell a story in the book, when they actually put me on a low dose antidepressant. Uh, it was called Elevil. And I was on that. Um, as a preventative for headaches, or that's one of the things they tried through my journey. And uh, that drug now has a black box warning on it that there's a that shouldn't be prescribed to teenagers because there's an increased risk of suicide mm -hmm. um, and violent behavior. And I um, tell the story of I was actually I'd never been as depressed in my life as I was when I was was I was taking that. Um, but I you know so you hear you're taking a. Again, back to lefitis, you're taking yeah. something to help your headaches, and it's and there's another side effect, another another effect of it. But I heard a definition once of of depression as the loss of a game, you know, and I think that really resonates with me because depression can be, because depression can actually come after major wins, like you think of postpartum depression, that whole mm -hmm. pregnancy and going through, and you know, there's some physical things behind it, but like that's a great win of taking a pregnancy and having a baby. Um, but then also you can get depression after it. And there's, you know, there's athletes Michael Phelps have talked about. Oh, you know, for sure. He's been an you know, Olympic athlete, obviously incredibly successful. Um, he was training uh, training a little bit around uh, University of Michigan when I was there. And it's like the depression actually after big wins, which I don't think is talked about on top of. Um, but it's just the end of something um, without ag another game there to play And again, next. and you can't touch it, feel it, whatever. But we, again, back to the energy. Exactly. Um, you know, I think sometimes we're looking at the body is 100 times more receptive to energetic yeah. stimuli than physical signals, such as hormones. That was mind-blowing, right? Mind-blowing. 100 times? Yeah. It's a guy named McClare out of Oxford University. But 100, your body's, it, say that again for the audience. Yeah. So the body is 100 times more receptive 
to energetic stimuli than physical signals such as hormones. Yeah. So your body's 100 times more receptive to energy than it is to things. And the example I like to give for this is, have any of you guys ever eaten a certain food and felt better, more energetic, and eaten something else and felt blah? And most people will say yes. Some people will say, no, I feel the same after everything. No. But <laughs> I would say no. Yeah. They're just masking or they're yeah. not in tune to their body. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> but then you ask them, have you ever been around certain people and felt more energized and uplifted? And have you ever been around other people and say, feel drained? And everyone will look at me and say, oh, God, yes. <laughs> you know, everyone can relate to that idea. And so what's happening in those environments? It's energy. You're actually, your, your energy level is changing. You're feeling the energy of those people around you. And it is incredibly powerful. One of the things we used to do, as you know, back in the day, um, I was the director of fitness and personal training at the MAC. Yeah, yeah. And we would sit down with the trainers. <laughs> and one of the things we would talk about is their clients. Yeah. And that are their clients, you know, a, a nine or a 10 or their, and I said, when you, and I would sit down with them privately. And I said, when you look at your calendar, your schedule, yeah. and you see certain clients on your, in your book, <laughs> and you yeah. hope they don't show up, yeah. it's probably something you need to, for you, your mental health, you need to move them into another, whether it's another trainer or change your conversation with them because it's really damaging you. Mm -hmm. It's damaging your energy, everything about you, mm -hmm. your persona, and you can tell yeah. the whole relationship right there, and that's all energy. Yeah. And so their yeah. trainers are eating healthy, they're doing that, that stuff, but if they have a lot of, really uh energy suckers yeah then then that's that can really cause them to be you know not healthy in their own world and so it was interesting sometimes they would say that to me and and i would say well, can you can you move the dial here yeah and then you need to have a con uh, honest conversation because if you can't move the dial then you need to move the client yeah yeah and so and so they were like i never thought of it that way i go yeah if you see them on the calendar and you go, oh no, they're on the calendar today. It's probably not a great thing. Yeah, I'll tell you that's a that's a great um, that's a great example. Like um, that's yeah, that's a great question. Can you move the dial? Or move the client? Because if you if you can't move the dial, that's where you start. Yeah. But then you need to because again, it's back to this whole energy. Because like you said, it it, it pulls you down, and we everybody we, we, and that's what you want to do ideally when we're talking about mental health. One of the things we try to say is, you know, what can you do to keep, get your energy higher well we know it's movement it's drinking water it's getting sleep and whatever but it's also who you surround yourself sure. with. sure yeah absolutely. if you surround yourself with people that help lift you up you know sometimes we it's not always life but it is what it is but i think that's also something that i don't think we think enough about is like who who and i sit this down with my clients i'm like talk to me about your circle yeah because if your circle's taking you down it's probably not going to be a good thing for you mentally and physically emotionally spiritually whatever we want to discuss yeah so. and that's mass last podcast was on the power of you know yeah the one over um was on gratitude and right. thankfulness Thank right i mean that's one thing that i've how done how powerful is that that's one thing i've done i do a gratitude journal every day and i've done it for about 11 years and i think you that's have like it in the end of your book yeah and i think yeah exactly and i, I put that acknowledgement i instead of calling it acknowledgement it's not just the books i called it gratitude i loved it i felt like that's one of like the things that's been like really incredibly grounding for me i spend you know five to 10 minutes every morning doing that and then doing it at the end of the day. And I, cause you know, we think about eating well, we think about working out, but what are the disciplines that we're doing? What are those, you know, shared earlier today, like a discipline is like a, one de definition I really like is a set series of actions that leads to an expected end result. Yeah, I like that set series of actions. Yeah. So it's a set series of actions that leads to an expected end result. So what are the disciplines we can apply to work on our spiritual or emotional health? And for me, that gratitude process each morning, touch it each morning, touch it each night has been great. And the power of that, so you say, okay, so that's fine, but what does that really matter? Well, based on research, if you wear a seatbelt, it adds one to three years to your life. If you ha handle high blood pressure, that adds about one to three years to your life. You know, optimize your weight, it's about the same. Um, optimists will outlive pessimists by s between seven and 15 years. So your mood level is two to three more times powerful than your weight. Back to two the to field, back to the energy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Two to three times more powerful yeah. than, um, you know, than the blood pressure and the weight and all that stuff. And, you know, all of that matters. And, you know, we put, you know, part of my life is physical disciplines as well and sure. disciplines around food. 
But I think those, those idea of emotional disciplines, I think there's a question of what are those things, right? And then how can you apply those? But do you give those, because there's a lot of people who go to the gym every day, but they'll be upset while they're there, <laughs> right? Well, and I think that's, that's a takeaway right here for the listeners, the viewers, is that, again, we kind of, we weigh in the physical, yeah. you know, let's do the exercise, yeah. weight, eating, whatever. But one of the things we want to make sure that, you know, your other discipline is, and again, I, I know myself, I catch myself sometimes and my mood's low and I'm like, anytime you can kind of move into the gratitude world, yeah. uh, it, everything comes up. Yeah. It's really hard to be grumpy <laughs> yeah. when you're, and like you said, just because you go to the gym and you're miserable doesn't mean it's a, it's a great thing. Yeah. Something I like to joke about and Bailey and I have talked about is like, you kind of watch people run. Right. And there's just some people are like very light and easy, <laughs> but it's rare. Right? right. Most people, you almost feel like they're running away from heart it's, disease. It's they're like, like angry and they're defeated. miserable. Yeah, exactly. Hate it. Can't you stand it. You can feel the mood I'm level. I'm on the step mill. I hate it. Yeah. yeah. I'm here because yeah. my husband made me or my wife made me or I'm, my doctor <laughs> told me I have I'm to. Not, I'm not enjoying the process. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So we got two more as yeah. we wrap this up. Yep. Chapter five, you talk about the Olympic strength principle, how titanic problems lead to Olympic strength. Yeah, so this is this this is the story of the Titanic had two sister ships. One of them was the Olympic, and after the Titanic sank, the Olympic got stronger. So how that happened was they realized what the weaknesses were in the Titanic, and they added something called a double hull. So they strengthened up the hull, and they added they put more lifeboats on the boat. So they basically, and that ship sailed for another thirty years, it had no issues. Um, so the the question is, how can we use stress to make us stronger? Right? And the idea is, can we grow through the stress? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. There's a, uh, a lady, um, her name is McDonald, um, out in, at Stanford University. And she did a study, and she looked at like 30,000 people and their levels of stress and how long they lived. And what she found out was the people who were the most stressed lived the shortest. They died quicker. Okay, that kind of makes sense. But then what was really interesting and kind of like revolutionary about that study is she found that people who were under the most stress but really enjoyed what they did and had a positive mood level about it, actually live longer than the people under the least stress. So this is where we start getting an idea, because we're all going to have different stress in our life, but is it the stress of us you know, finding what we love, doing what we love, helping people, whatever that, whatever is finding meaning for us, can we do it in a high mood level? Can we do it because we feel a sense of purpose and passion behind it? Mm-hmm. And that takes, you know, that takes work. It's not easy. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a journey. But if you can do that, that's how you turn stress, the negative, into a positive and actually develop strength through it. Well, I think what you're saying, too, is, um, you know, you can be symptom-free in calm waters. Yeah. You talked about that. Yeah. You know, hey, I feel great, but I can't. My 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 capacity is so tiny. Yeah. Yep. So everything's okay. Yeah. You know, I used to, we used to do these, you know, movement screens. Yep. So when a person comes in and does training, I run them through movement screens. Yeah. And I'll ask them, hey, do you got this problem, that problem? Nope, I don't have any issues. You know, I feel great. And then you do a couple movement screens with them, and like, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. And you realize, you know, they're, now they're, the self-awareness is yeah. coming out that mm-hmm. maybe my calm waters doesn't allow me to do. Because you're saying I want to do this over here. Yeah. But I haven't really put that progression and an adaptation on, on the body. So again, so what you're saying is that the the Titanic, we learned a lot from the Titanic and we made it better by changing some of the weaknesses or challenge the weaknesses. I remember you were talking about the I think it was the bolts or yeah in the hull. Yep. And so uh, some of them were a little bit weaker. Yeah. So in the hull split apart and then in, it went down and away we we away it we came went to the, the weak part. And and that and this happens in the body. So the way exercise, exercise is a stressor, 100%, but it's a stressor that makes us stronger. And one of the best things for bone health, because a lot of people think, oh, I need to take calcium, or maybe they think I need to take calcium and vitamin D. And you know, one of the issues is most calcium that they sell is something called calcium carbonate, mm-hmm. which is limestone, which is almost impossible to digest. Impossible. But what's missing mm-hmm. is what you need to create bone growth is a signal from the body. You need stress. The body strengthens in response to stress. And so what that means is weight-bearing exercise, Mm -hmm. weights, running, trampoline work are fantastic triggers for the body. So you can use the stress of exercise, the stress of movement, to actually create a stronger body. Yeah, how to create more balance, repair, build, just kind of keep going through that whole thing because you went through the whole thing of osteoporosis and digestion and autoimmune system, the hormones, the list goes on. But again, back to, you know, how do we take – 
what we're being, you know, pushed upon. Because yeah. strength training is so, you know, we always talk about it's the fount of youth. But what, what does it do? Well, it puts adaptations to the connective tissue and the yeah. bone and the muscle. And so the, it has to get better. It has to adapt. Yeah. And it has to it gets stronger along yeah. the way. If you do it, again, having that right rest and recovery and whatever that goes with that exactly so the right kind of stress makes you stronger right the wrong kind of stress you do it without form without rest without recovery without the right foods you can absolutely injure yourself yeah, break or breaks, make yourself worse breaks you down the so, right kind of stress can make you stronger that's the point of that chapter yeah so again the right that's the the key is the yeah pot, the right type yeah um the last chapter is <laughs> i had to laugh because <laughs> that's the tagline of my book Oh, wow. That's the tagline of what we, and that, what I mean by that is that the, the last chapter, six, is a gold, golden you principle. So walk us through that. Yeah, and I, I the love The power the, of the infinite you is your tagline. Yeah, and basically the idea is all healing comes from within, right? And I think that's what I didn't realize as a six-year-old when I was going to see doctors and putting my faith in a doctor, or putting my faith in a pill, or putting a faith in a surgery or just hoping for some of that stuff to change, what I didn't realize is the incredible ability that the body has to heal, right? And I didn't realize what our body was capable of, what we're capable of. And that's basically it because a lot of us can be, can go through hardships and we do, right? We've and just incredible hardships in life. And one of them that was, you know, formational in my life or was these headaches, so those headaches are a great example of, and what I found is I actually have to unlock my body's own ability to heal. So I had to look what is actually, what are the blocks or stops that I have in my own life? And that's what a great coach or a mentor or any kind of, I use the term healer. Healer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but a healer could be a doctor. And it could be a physical therapist, could be a chiropractor, could be a nutritionist could be a movement science person, could be acupuncture. I mean, there's many different modalities of healing. But I think the key with the healer is it's unlocking your own ability to heal or get better. And I think that's the huge takeaway of this whole entire book, that the power is in you. Exactly. And you have the power, and the human body is incredible, its ability to heal and self-correct. Exactly. But I think the other thing, too, I really liked what you were saying, and said you don't have to take this journey by yourself. Yeah. You know, there's so many people out there. Like, I try to surround myself with people like yourself. I have a massage therapist. I have a physical therapist. I have a trainer I work with. I mean, a chiropractor. You want to surround yourself with a lot and positive, energetic people. And there's a lot of things that go in play, to because we're all going to get knocked down. Yeah. But we also have to remember that the magic is in you. You have that power. And we need to have that come out. But I, I, the longer I've been doing this, what you're saying is the human body is just, it, I always like, wow. Yeah. You know, I started working with a physical therapist rec recently for my hamstring issue. And she's opened my mind up that I need to do this a little bit more. Yeah. And I need a little, and I would have never known yeah. that. I just thought, I just got to have a chronic hamstring issue. Yeah. So, so I think that's the whole power. That's the message today that. Wherever you are, I mean, it's almost a gift that you were, I mean, it wasn't at the time, but yeah. that you had headaches. That, that's the point I got to. That's the point I got to. And that's that Olympic principle, right? That stress was very difficult. I wouldn't have wished it on anybody. It was, you know, what felt like hell to go through, um, but turned out to be. But if you didn't go through that, you probably wouldn't be sitting here today. 100%. This, this book wouldn't be happening. I've got a clinic. We've been able to help right. a lot of, you know, help a lot of people and. Yeah, it just it's it's. So it's, I think think sometimes that Olympic principle, we all have to remember that that sometimes when we go through the worst things, yeah, it's 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 doing what it's supposed to. Yeah, and it's, it's putting us on a different path. And it's hard as heck going through. It, oh, right? yeah, no, it's, it's brutal. It, it's hell going through it. Like brutal. I don't want to like sugarcoat any of this, and no. we've all gone through that. But within that, there's the opportunity for growth and getting better. Right. And just one thing my mom always said, and she'd be really happy that I'm sharing this. It's like that something good was going to come out of this. Correct. You know, and just like, it was a constant like mantra sh she had over those 10, 13 years is just like looking for it and you just you keep doing the work, but looking for what's that positivity that can come out of it. And, you know, thankfully. Um, and, 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 you know, you're blessed to have two really amazing parents that are very positive. But yeah. I think whether it's relationships or the mind and the body, whatever it is, but 
sometimes we have to just kind of just say, hey, we're in a storm. We're in the, you know, yeah. but we're probably going to be better when we come out. And most of the time, if we all look back and all the challenges we have in our lives, some of the worst stuff is sometimes the best yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is the Olympic principle in, yeah. in, in, in spades. So, yeah. All right, so as we wrap this up, is there anything else you want to share with us? I mean, to me, when I, I, I thought your book was amazing, again, it's um, The Five Truths of Transformational Wellness and Holistic Healing. It's called uh, Timeless Youth by Dr. Jeffrey Crippen. Um, again, it's been a pleasure to you take the time today and talk with you. And again, it feels like, you know, I mean, when I work with your dad and your mom comes in and works with Tab, it's just, uh, you know, we always hear about what you're doing and, yeah. you know, it's all good stuff. And, you know, they're sharing, they're very proud of what you do and, and what you've become over the years. So anyway, sometimes you don't always probably hear that from your parents, but I do. So yeah. <laughs> is there anything else you want to share with anybody, with, with the listeners out there? Well, you, um, you covered everything. Yeah, no, I think, I think this was, this was awesome. So it's a real honor to come in and it's, it's like, you know, I, I live, you know, down in Texas, so it's, you know. 1500 a couple thousand miles away but it's like it gives me a lot of confidence to know there's like great people here supporting my family sure so i just want to appreciate you yeah. and, and tab and kind of the team here because it makes it easier you know you always care about your parents and sometimes you know it's great to be there close to them but to know they've got a great team around here is is awesome and i remember um you you got us involved in speaking in guadalajara <laughs> yeah. with raul yeah. and his whole deal yeah and i remember that was i mean i remember when i took Matt with went yeah. with me and oh, I remember Tab. That. Yeah. All the all the all the uh, women love Tab. Oh, they want to touch him. We're and, on the you know, soccer field him. in the right. middle of Guadalajara, Mexico. And and you guys, how many people workouts? do we have there? Uh, at, at some of those events, we would have easily had seven hundred or a thousand. I remember we're on the <laughs> soccer field doing workouts. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. We're up in the stands doing that. That was pretty amazing. Okay. And, and yeah. Raul, Raul, when I saw him in your book, he was he was just a. We had a great time with those guys, but yeah. that was again you connected the dots and that yeah. all worked together. So we went there three years in a row. It was pretty incredible. So yeah, no, that was awesome. That the book, um, it's, it's awesome to be here. Great timing. The book came out Tuesday. Now, how can they get a hold of the book? Yeah, so the book came out Tuesday. So it's um, you can find it. It's available through any major bookseller. So it's on you know Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, you know you can find it at any bookstore. Um, it's also we got a website, Timeless Youth timelessyouthbook.com okay. and you can find it there as well um, but pretty much available anywhere books are sold and uh, yeah, it just came out uh, a couple days before we're recording this so you guys will be um, first to get their hands among on the it. first to know and we're super excited to, I mean, you know it's, it's, it's a big project as you know I mean you were kind of someone who had some calls and kind of mentored me a little bit on that book process and kind of what you went through and I remember those conversations we had but it's you know it's a journey it's a five and a half year journey to put this here in a 25 year journey of health to get to the point to get the yeah, knowledge these things to just write don't it. come out in two seconds <laughs> no they don't so it's, it's awesome to to see it here no and it's but a, i loved what you put down you put a lot of energy into it you put a lot of time into it, a lot of thinking yeah. and i thought it was a fantastic read so again i check it out timeless youth by dr jeff crippen and uh again thanks for coming in today we really appreciate it and i think uh, our listeners and viewers are going to get a lot of good nuggets out of this conversation we had today so thanks again awesome